Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the rather cool garage. When I say cool, I'm talking about the temperature rather than the decor. I'm Jeremy Cordo, Peter Clayton's behind the camera, and this is the Court of Public Opinion. Do stay with us and enjoy. Um, and thank you for all your comments, by the way. Much appreciated. And of course, your phone calls on, on Friday, if you've got a moment to give us a ring. Why wasn't something done about the CFMEU corruption? That's been one of the most common comments I've heard of recent controversies. They must have known. They, of course, means, I guess, the authorities, the police, Fair Work Australia, and, of course, the media. Look, I've thought a bit about it. These guys, the CFMEU, are like the Mafia or that really nasty underbelly side of the CFMEU. And I am not sure how, how deep that contamination goes. But like the Mafia, they control through fear and political patronage. What we need is an Elliot Ness. You know, a kick the door down, holding the axe, Elliot Ness. No nonsense cop on the beat. And we had Nick McKenzie, who was the splendid investigative journalist from uh, nine newspapers and 60 Minutes on the show on Friday. And he, he, was, he was excellent. Uh, what a breath of fresh air that man is. We also had Senator John Quirk, Labor Senator, and he regaled us with some fascinating stories about the Builders Laborers Federation, which was the kind of the forerunner of the CFMEU. And he was telling us about the um, REM building, the REM site, which was this huge development, probably the biggest Adelaide had seen ever on uh, North Terrace. It went from North Terrace right back through to, uh, to um, Rundle Mall. It's now the Maya Centre, but it was the REM Centre. And uh, that place, it was estimated that it would cost $100 million to build it. It ended up costing a billion dollars. Ten times. Ten times what it was supposed to. And John Quirk was saying that the, the problem was that the union was just playing them, playing them like a fiddle. There was a thing called the Dim Sim Allowance, which I had <laughs> quite forgotten about. And this was because the workers on the REM site could smell Chinese food, which was driving them crazy. So they, they stopped work because they smelt Chinese food. There were thousands of innovative excuses to stop work. Um, and sometimes they'd do it in the middle of a concrete pour, which meant, of course, you had to come and jackhammer up all of the concrete and start again. And this went on and on and on. And I remember they had a, uh, uh, and, 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 and the senator remembers too, they had a, a poetry reading every day. The, the workers had to come off the building site and gather round and have poetry read to them. Anyway, it ended up uh, uh, sending the state bank, because they funded it, sending the state bank broke was one of the reasons that this state bank went broke. But, but then again, as, as the senator pointed out, there was 333 Collins Street. Every city had one of these. And uh, as I say, the Builders Laborers Federation was playing the system like a fiddle. And they were allowed to and got away with it. Eventually, uh, they went, the building, not only the bank, but the building went bank bankrupt as well. And uh, instead of being able to sell it for what it cost you, they sold it for a hundred million dollars. They took a, 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 a nine hundred million dollar bath. It's, it is really quite disgraceful. But it's amazing how people forget. Good thing we've got people like Senator John Quirk around and of course Nick McKenzie. You have to understand that the trade union movement has Billions of dollars behind it these days. Billions of dollars. Energised, of course, by Paul Keating through his industry super funds. Industry super funds, of course, are union super funds. 
This is both a, a war, ladies and gentlemen, that we can't win, but it's a war we can't afford to lose. It is a big problem. The various Labour governments have said loud and clear that they will not take donations from the construction division of the CFMEU. Well, whoop de do. I totally agree with that. The money, however, will just come from another source within the union, probably. It is a very, very big organisation. They're everywhere, from sea to shining sea. Make no mistake, the money will flow from the CFMEU to government. And I think it stinks. If nine newspapers hadn't published all of that stuff, it would have gone on and on and on and on. There is, of course, an eruption every once in a while and a royal commission is thrown at it. Uh, but nothing seems to get done. Let's get rid of compulsory trade union membership. Just let membership of a trade union be so good and so attractive people will want to join. Don't compel people to do it. And do that now. And start with the Union of Students, if I could suggest that. I mean, could you imagine universities, places of learning, higher learning, freedom of thought, soaring spirits and ambitions, and everyone has to join the Students' Union. Well, and they're a pretty militant bloody bunch of people. I've got a poster over there. I'll get, I'll get Pete, you might take a picture of it later. And that's, that's very old, that's when the students seized 2GB. They, they literally seized the radio station, took it over and broadcast their own programs. Now that ain't militant, I mean that's a coup! <laughs> uh, and, and, and remember uh, Bob Gottliebson, who was on the Friday show a couple of weeks ago. Bob Gottliebson who uh, had uh, the Business Review Weekly for years and years, writes for the Australian now, wonderful articles. He told us about this deal that the government has done with the trade union movement to get a trade union delegate at every board table, big or small, around the entire country. That's scary. Remember that coming up to the next election. Um, Friday we lost a great talent in Bob Newhart. Uh, last Friday, he was 94, a fantastic entertainer, Bob Newhart. I, somebody sent me, and I think it was on, what was it on, Pete? It was on Facebook or? Oh, yes, Facebook. Yeah. Uh, it, look, in the coming weeks, if I can uh, find a way of getting that Facebook uh, posting onto the court of public opinion here from the garage, I'll do it because it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he's playing a, a psychologist and uh, it's, it's very funny. We'll try and do that. We really will. We must never, never forget to laugh. The climate warriors have discovered that uh, an old coal mine closed 30 years ago, I think, uh, up near Newcastle in New South Wales, they've discovered that this old coal mine is emitting methane. They've done some, I, I don't know, thermal imaging or something, and I don't know who paid for that. Shock horror. Methane. Woo! So now they're calling for an audit of all coal mines, particularly the ones that are out of service or closed down, check all the coal mines for leakage of methane, the world's worst greenhouse gas. They, the climate warriors, and the media don't know or don't want to know that if it's methane that you're worried about, you're worried about the wrong source. <laughs> it is wetlands, wetlands that emit the worst and the most methane gas in the world. Right? Now how many times have we said that on this program? Wetlands, marshes and deltas produce almost 50% of the methane that these people are whinging about. But no, we couldn't, no. Wetlands are lovely, they've got, uh, you know, no, that's nature, that's uh, 
These people are so thick, it's annoying, it really is. And I'm so glad the British courts are showing the way by jailing five climate demonstrators. These are the uh, Just Stop Oil people who have blocked major motorways, and not just once or twice. They climb on bridges and gantries and things and hang from them. We see it here in Adelaide. The protesters, they cause huge traffic chaos, uh, costing millions if not billions of dollars. Four of them got four years, and the leader of the group got five years. Good work. That might teach him something. Might teach him something. Perno Ricard uh, are going to sell some of, or really most of their popular Australian wine labels. Uh, Jacobs Creek, I think, Orlando, St Hugo, Stone Lee, Church Block. Uh, and all of this includes the wineries, you know, not just the label. Seven huge, huge wineries. Some of the most popular Australian brands have been sold to, it's called uh, Accolade, which is owned by Bain, uh, which is one of these great big American venture capitalists uh, who already own, I think, Hardy's, um, Grant Burge, uh, Banrock Station. Anyway, I, I, it's, I'm very, I, I suppose it doesn't much matter if you like wine. I guess it doesn't much matter who owns the company as long as they keep up the standards and all that kind of thing. But it's just somehow sad that these great Australian brands are going to be owned, uh, well, firstly by the French and now by the Americans. Uh, I'll repeat this uh, in case you missed the live streaming show last Friday, JeremyCordo.com. Uh, we have the pleasure of broadcasting um, and I can't remember who sent it to me, but uh, we have the pleasure of broadcasting from the least smutty city in the country. Uh, true. Sydney loves smut. Sydney is the official head of smut, the smut capital of the country. <laughs> the people who discovered this, apparently, are called Love Honey Australia. And they've ranked all the cities across the country based on the residents' love of reading sexually explicit books. Sydney residents show the highest interest in smut, as shown in a Google search. Uh, Sydney, and then comes uh, Perth, followed by Brisbane, Melbourne, and then Adelaide. Yes, I just thought, I, in case you missed it last Friday. Uh, unemployment is up slightly. Uh, that's despite 50,000 new jobs being created. We are already, I don't know, probably just keeping up with population growth. Unemployment up to f from 4% to 4.1%, making an interest rate rise a little less likely. The only employment growth, uh, of course, is in the public sector. <laughs> that would be right. Inflation figures won't be out until I think it's the 31st of July, but that's going to be a very important snapshot because that's going to be a quarter, the last quarter, and that will tell us a lot more about where interest rates are going. Uh, I'm trying to get up for <coughs> the Friday show somebody to talk to me about interleukin-11. This is some sort of huge breakthrough that they've made in America. You might have heard about it. Uh, they're likening it to the elixir of life, or the fountain of youth. Uh, apparently it works with mice, and you can extrapolate that out to say that it's going to work with people. Uh, the mice are living 25% longer, thanks to this fountain of youth. Now, gee whiz. Now, on the surface, if, if, if you're confronted with living 25% longer, as long as it's, as long as, Pete, I don't know, it's, it's the life in your years, no, it's the years, no, it's the life in your years, not the years in your life. You don't want to spend 25% extra of your life sitting in a wheelchair. No. You, you, want, to, you want to get... <laughs> what, what worries about that is the world is already grossly overpopulated. Well, that's true. I mean, people scream about climate and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it, population is the... Well, we, don't, uh, we don't need people living 25%... Longer. No, 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 no. It's a tricky one. But I tell you what, there'll be a huge stampede 
for people to get hold of that. There was a product made in, oh, I don't know, Yugoslavia or somewhere called KH3. And uh, it was allowed in Australia, and then for some reason they banned it. I don't know why. You used to be, uh, you used to be on, used, I was on KH3. I remember I did an interview with the people who were bringing it into the country. And uh, I, uh, I, I got a, had to get a prescription. I got a prescription and I, I, uh, I was on it for about two years. I can't remember how successful it was. I don't know. Uh, I loved watching um, Sarah Ferguson on uh, 7.30 last week. Uh, playing catch up on this CFMEU story that's everywhere. Sally McManus, head of the ACTU. Why didn't the ABC ever do a story like this before the 60 Minutes story and the Age and Sydney Morning Herald exposés? Why? Why, I wonder? Oh, I don't know. The ABC, it's like the government the Labour Party, the trade union movement, the rest of the media. Sort of like a conspiracy of silence, with the occasional Royal Commission thrown in, but nothing ever happens. Ignorance and stupidity? Well, I've gotten away with it for years, why not? Sally McManus says she never knew, never heard anything about this. Even the allegations of criminal behaviour within the CFMEU. No intimidation, no corruption. She only had to listen. Well, I've been saying it for 40 years. And I'm sure others have been saying it as well. And others have been bearing the brunt of it as, at the same time. Oh boy. And the Powder Puff interview, <laughs> by Powder Puff I mean very gentle, you know, because very, no, no searching, hard hitting questions. If Sally was going to go public and have a talk about this whole issue, where would she go for, for, for gentle treatment? Well, the ABC is the answer. Simple as that. We've got to go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much for your company. I wish you a happy birthday and a happy wedding anniversary. If it's a day of celebration, I hope it's going to be a really good one. It's July 24. Uh, what can I tell you about the day? Marvin the Martian, Warner Brothers cartoon character. Oh yeah, I know him. 1948 made his debut. Uh, 1897 on this day. Amelia Earhart, American aviator, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. She was born in Kansas. She died in 1930. Nine. Amelia Earhart. Yes, it was just at the beginning of the war, wasn't it? Uh, lots of stories about how she died, the plane disappears, that she was on some sort of... Um, she had an excuse because she was a famous aviatrix, but she was really spying on... Oh, I don't know. We love a conspiracy theory. Alexander Dumas, the French author, Three Musketeers, the Count of Monte Cristo. He was born in France. He died in 1870, born this day in 1802. Tenth millionth, wow, the tenth millionth mini car produced its 60th anniversary year in Oxford, England in 1919. Well, I don't know that the ones they were producing in 1919, you couldn't really call them minis, could you? I, the, the mini, the genuine mini, the real McCoy, that was the 1960s mini. I don't know that the modern mini can be... Uh, oh, well, look. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, directed by Steven Spielberg, starring Tom Hanks, 19... 98 released uh, Academy Award winner best director 1999 it was a good movie did you see it Pete oh yeah whoa For, as, a, as a war movie it, it, it was 
Yeah. It was terrific. It was brilliant, yes, a brilliant movie. Mm. Saving Private Ryan. Linda Carter, American actress, Wonder Woman, 1951, born in Phoenix, Arizona, on this day. Oh, yeah, and uh, at 1251, 1251, Apollo 11 returns to Earth. That's Eastern time. Uh, after taking the first astronauts to the moon and returning them safely. That was this day at exactly... 1251 EDT 1969 Peter Sellers English actor and comedian The Goon Show The Pink Panther he dies at just 54 1980 in fact he died only about oh golly I think it was about three weeks after coming on my show I talked to him on uh, 5DN the morning show uh, the only stipulation we, we worked for we worked for months to get him on the show. The only stipulation he he uh, he gave or demanded was that he did the entire he did the entire interview in German. I, I, Pete, I'm not kidding. But he, he he did it, but he did it with a German accent, not in in the language. <laughs> I think he must have been a little mad. Anyway, 1980 he died on this day. Um, Singer songwriter, iconic Joni Mitchell. Do you like her? Yes. Very yeah, good. she's lovely. Makes a surprise concert appearance at the Newport Folk Festival. Mitchell's first public appearance in 19 years. That was on this day in 2022. The trial of Dutch erotic dancer, and I think spy, Marta Hari begins in Paris. Spying for Germany, 1917. I think they killed her. I think they executed Marta Hari. And, uh, oh, the first greeting telegram was sent in Britain on this day in 1935. Some of the things for which we remember the day. Thanks for being with us here in the garage, which is rather chilly, I have to tell you. Ooh. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, from around the dining room table, we will see you next. That'll be on Friday between 9 o'clock and 12, jeremycordo.com. Interesting guests. Professor Plymer will be with us. Uh, I want to talk to uh, John, Dr. John Bruni about the uh, political shenanigans in the United States and what he makes of all of that. We've got a busy show on Friday. I hope you'll be part of it. I'm Jeremy Cordo, Peter Clayton and I'll be back. Thank you for being with us here in the Court of Public Opinion.